they're eligible for a discharge. So I, I think what I would say is there's two different things that we've, we've been talking about. So to, to be clear, I'll sort of talk, I'll separate them in the beginning. One is the closed school discharge that, that relates to students who were there right. when it closed or who withdrew within 120 days of closure. And so that, though, that student population, we are making, trying to get contact information from whatever source we can um, and send those folks emails, people who have complained to our office, we're, we're trying to get them information, we're trying to push information out through legal aid com community, we're trying to do webinars, we're trying to do, uh, we, we're giving flyers to the community college chancellor's office uh, to have available at all the community colleges. Um, we've tried to work with all of our partners to get the, to get the word out there that you need, uh, you really should do this um, closed school discharge, that it's very important. And we're also hoping and, and advocating that the, this, the Department of Education actually has the ability to move the closure date earlier and to, to expand the number of students. And we're also advocating right. to try to move that closure date earlier so that more students will be benefited. The other thing we've talked about today is the defense to repayment. And under the federal regulations, there is a defense to repayment for students who, even if they've graduated, if the school um, they attended violated state law. Uh, more or less precisely as alleged for a complaint. So we are, we are attempting to do everything we can to, have, to get the federal government, the federal Department of Education to streamline that process so that students can take advantage of that, students who've graduated who, and who have not gotten the, the job they thought and who were deceived. So that's what we're, we're trying to do. Is the ineligibility on the first, the first group of people, you get, a, you get a transfer credits or you had a teach out or, what happens if that's not complete? You know, you, I, I got some credits transferred. I got 30, and, but they transfer eight, right? And I'm still on the hook for $49,000. million or $49, That means that none of the, the, the debt would be eligible? Or just, is that the way the federal government's running the program? It's unfortunately very unclear. So the, the way it works is it's a transfer to the this, this same program of study or similar program of study as the term of art in the regulation. So if somebody were studying to be a mechanic and then they decided to become a nurse, you know, could they use some of those credits because it's not the same program of study? That's something that we're seeking additional clarification from, from the Department of Education because we believe some of those credits should be able to be utilized. Are you able to make an argument under the defense, the second group, is that, is that I, I was in one lousy program. I, got, I agreed to transfer to some other lousy, lousy program, so then I'm opted out, but I really, they never represented the, the, you know, the default rate or, the, or, or the, uh, the scope of the classes. There was something there because, again, there's a lot of classifications that kids are falling in, and if you're, if you, if you're not there at the time they close, it seems like you've got not much chance. You see what I'm, my question is? Yeah, I, I, think, I think I do. I mean, what we're trying to do is establish as many state law violations as possible and to prove mm -hmm. those because the proof of that will assist the students in, in asserting these discharges. For example, if a job placement rate is demonstrably false, if the Department of Education you know, looks at the fine letter where it found over 900 uh, job placement misrepresentations, take a look at that and, and use that to help broader classes of students. That's, that's what we're hoping to do. Yeah, no, very good. And thanks. Senator Hill. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. The uh, question in the, you mentioned from the student aid, I have a, a couple of questions. Hearing from students who weren't Cal Grant eligible, um, and we've certainly heard from the Bureau of your communication with students on different issues and, and trying to reach out to them. Uh, my question to all of you is, is how are you centralizing and or sharing information or tracking it or making sure that going to, to Senator Wykowski's and, and other questions that, uh, that, that to make sure that the students are getting a comprehensive amount of information, the correct amount of information, the opportunities available to them, and that we know what has been communicated and to whom we've communicated that. Is there that ability of centralizing the data collection or, or the information that is being uh, imparted today? So the Student Aid Commission has on its website links to the Bureau and the Attorney General's office. I think we're duplicating the information that's going out to students. We have the direct information to those students who were Cal Grant recipients as well as those students who were offered a Cal Grant but a payment was never dispersed to their campus. 
So I think we're, we're linking our sites. The same information is out there. And in, in terms of providing their information for the Cal Grant recipients, we're communicating directly with those students as to what options and the status of their payment disbursements. Um, there are students who have communicated with us. Um, we have received contacts from students that were at the WyoTech when they heard that Heald had closed WyoTech and the Everest Colleges wanting to understand what was in it for them as well. Now, again, WyoTech and Everest Colleges, they were eliminated from the Cal Grant program because they did not meet the CDR, the cohort default rate. But in, under, in learning that the Heald Colleges now are, Heald College students are receiving assistance, their questions are, you know, what, what are we doing for the WyoTech and the Everest College students? Well, I see, that, you know, some of the people would be calling, you know, the Bureau and Ms. Wenzel at the same time, they'd be calling uh, you and vice versa for, for information. Uh, are you communicating with one another to share that information? I guess that's the, the concern. I know the issue is if they start hearing from a number of different people and they may hear different information, they may not know what to follow or they may think that you know, they become, feel they're being irritated by this. And, um, and I'm sure not a website is the only communication. You want personal contact and, and some, the ability to make sure that they're aware of the opportunities that are available to them. And, and so I would think that hopefully you can determine a way to make sure that the people are being communicated with and that the amount of information that is certainly accurate, but that it's um, maybe redundancy is important in some case, but that, that you are making that communication. So hopefully there, there's some way to, to centralize that communication. Senator, I think early on, um, one of the, Jennifer from the AG's office, actually um, kind of was the, the hub, as it were, as far as making sure that we all had consistent information and that we were going forward with consistent information. And I think um, that's really the important part, to make sure that we're all saying the same thing so you don't, um, you don't have students that are shopping around and, and basically wandering around confused. So I think early on, even, and I think the webcast actually facilitated that ability to make sure we all understood what we're all talking about. Yeah, so we're saying I, I the same thing. We just don't want, we want to make sure that there's no one left out, no one ignored, no right. one missed in this, in this communication. A question also, Ms. Wenzel, the, uh, in our meeting last week, which was very helpful, uh, you, you mentioned you conduct workshops for schools to be aware of how to, uh, to apply to, uh, to be in compliance with, uh, with the laws. But uh, do you do anything like that for students to make sure that uh, on an ongoing basis to teach them about your role and, and options that exist for them, um, like uh, outreach about student tuition recovery fund or trainings on how to file claims? You know, we certainly with the schools, but is there something on an ongoing basis for students so that they're aware of what opportunities they have? Not yet, but that is something that we're working on presently. Right now, our contact, most of our contact with students is when we um, actually do surveys when we're on site doing our compliance inspections. We actually meet with students at that point. But as far as what to expect, that's our, our next up on our, um, on, our outreach, on our outreach calendar is developing that. that the hard part is actually getting to the students. So we have some stakeholders that we're working, that we're going to be working with to help us figure out how best to get to those students. The, um, in the loan discharge information that you're providing, uh, that um, are, are you, and I noticed in the uh, LAO's analysis on page six, it talks about the, the economic loss, certainly the, the, the includes a student's loan, cost of required equipment and materials, and interest on student loan debt used to pay those charges. Are you advising them and to make sure that they are eligible for those discharges and that information as well? We actually ask students to send us everything they have, and we'll go through and calculate that out for them so that they're, because most of them are so confused at this point about what's what. So um, we do everything we can to try to get them to submit whatever they have, and then we assist them in sorting that out. That's good. Um, you know, with, with regards to the emergency action you took a few days prior to the Corinthian uh, closure, which halted enrollments in the, in the schools, California schools, are, are there statutory amendments you believe would be helpful uh, for you to take swift action in the event uh, you need to do something in the future like, like this? Uh, and maybe you could think about it. Uh, do you have enough flexibility to make those determinations early on? 
to prevent students from being subject to uh, uh, the difficulty of a closure and the problems? Or is there some tools that we can provide you with in the future that you think would be helpful based on the experience from this, this episode? Let us ponder that and get back to you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Okay, um, Senator Block and then Senator Hancock. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Lentz, I've got to follow up on my earlier question because we're talking about additional things the Bureau could do or should do or, and, and that you hope to do. Um, you know, the law was really clear. You were supposed to have regulations promulgated that would have protected students in these kinds of situations by July 1st of 2014. Now, contrary to the law, your Bureau didn't do that. Um, what went wrong? Why didn't you follow the law? A couple of things happened. We had a change in management, a huge turnover in, in management at the top. And um, we had the auditors come in the front door. And as far as getting to, to promulgating those regulations, it just didn't get done until closer to what? We actually started working on them. And they were in front of the advisory committee a couple of times that would have put them through timely, but the rewrites, it just, it just didn't happen. These, they aren't. these aren't very acceptable excuses, pardon okay. me, but um, I mean, can you identify certain things that were problematic that we may be able to correct? Because frankly, this caused part of the problem we're seeing now, and, and it just didn't happen isn't a good enough reason. The law said it must happen by July, 14, by July of 2014. Um, I understand you've had change in leadership, but, but you're in charge now, so I, I'm a little bit frustrated, as you can tell. I, I'm not so concerned about what great things the Bureau might do in the next year or two years or 10 years or decade, two decades. I, I'm interested in why you didn't do, didn't do what you were supposed to do last year. I, all I can say is we're working on those now, and they are in the process. I can't get them done timely at this point. I'm afraid that doesn't help the students who are suffering because it wasn't done. Um, I, I, did you communicate to uh, the legislature that you were unable to meet the legal requirements the legislature passed? Did you ask the legislature to... for help in, in meeting those requirements? And I nothing. No. Thank you. Um, Senator Hancock. Thank you, Senator Liu. Uh, Senator Block and I both <laughs> deal with budget subcommittees, and this is where it would be very helpful. If there are times when the law, uh, there's a decision not to implement something that was in a budget or a piece of legislation, the legislature could be informed as to why um, so that we could figure out what to do. But that's... Um, I. I'm, I have some questions that really stem from um, the work of the Public Safety Committee, which is what I'm most familiar with. And um, if I may ask, what are the criminal penalties for um, this kind of thing? And would the charge be fraud or some kind of violation of a state regulation? Civil court, criminal court, can the district attorney, attorney general's office tell me? Uh, so I, I think that this the... Is, yeah, not related to this case. This is a hypothetical. Okay, yeah, this, Ta taking a separate and apart from the Corinthian situation, just in terms of the, the overall regulation, I'll do the best mm -hmm. I can. Just keep bearing from in mind the business that plan. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer in the consumer law section. We generally yeah. bring civil cases. Um, so that our most important tool in the consumer law section is the unfair competition law and the false advertising law. Those both can be um, enforced criminally as well uh, as misdemeanors. But basically, uh, you have a problem with our section if you engage in false advertising, um, if you break the law. The UCL actually has an unlawful prong. So if, it's, if, it, if there's a violation of federal, state law, any regulation that's unlawful, it's unfair or fraudulent. So we have a very flexible tool in the UCL and the false advertising law, um, it, you know, for us to bring civil cases. But it would be a case that would have a misdemeanor penalty. 
Potentially. Our civil cases, this case, uh, you know, civil cases, we generally bring, uh, you know, for injunctive relief and $2,500 penalties for each violation. So there's a $2,500 penalty for each um, issuance of a false ad, $2,500 penalty for each uh, unlawful violation, and you can add them together, the false advertising law and the unfair competition Got law. Got it. Now, how does... What happens then when bankruptcy is declared? Can we collect? <laughs> um, well, obviously you can't collect if there's no money. So, so <laughs> that, is, okay. that is an issue. But so would, does fraud, a criminal activity, uh, lead to a prison sentence as opposed to a misdemeanor and maybe a fine that you can't collect? Again, in, in the purely you hypothetical. Know, hypothetical, yeah. hypothetical here, um, I mean, I think if you think about the, the company, you know, certainly companies are occasionally charged criminally, um, but the other obvious, you know, area would be the people that run the company. So I think that would be the area to see if any of those individuals, you know, violated state or federal criminal law. And that probably related to fraud. Well, certainly, you know, the federal government, the federal, you know, there's wire fraud, mail fraud, um, there's false, there's many, many federal tools that are available um, and, and state tools that are available uh, for criminal prosecutions when ads are, are promulgated that are knowingly false. Um, well, the email that you quoted sounded like a college educated person talking about how to get the money from uh, less educated and vulnerable people. That should just be, that's fraud, isn't it? Um, well, now I think we're not in hypothetical, so I probably okay. shouldn't comment well, on that. <laughs> um, okay, do you, do you happen to know what the criminal penalties are for fraud? I don't, my apologies. Okay. Um, in the one of the things I'm interested in is if corporations are people, but this corporation or any corporation should engage in widespread, deliberate taking people's money <laughs> in, in this way, um, who would be the libel parties in terms of going to prison? Well, certainly, you know, again, the hypothetical situation, a lot of these a lot of these schools are publicly traded. So in the, in the event that they made um, misstatements to investors, those are things that could be looked at. Um, and those, are made, those statements are made by individuals. Uh, sometimes if the corporate formalities are not respected, those, you can look at the individuals. Um, and if individuals certainly are running a company, they are, they are ultimately responsible for that company's conduct. And they can be, they can be held criminally responsible under a law. A variety of theories, but certainly someone else from my office, you know, potentially from special. I, I'm crimes interested case. because I thought the corporate form was, in fact, made to shield uh, individuals from personal responsibility. Um, well, I think in the civil context, it's a more effective shield than in the criminal context. I think the corporate form doesn't. If, if an individual violates a criminal law, they're responsible. The corporation won't shield them from that. Okay, and then um, I. Is the forfeiture of individual property something that can happen under litigation regarding fraud or false advertising or whatever? And I say that because if, if there are personal assets, at some point it seems to me they should be available to try to repay the people whose money has been taken. Um. Certainly, that's something you know we can analyze and get back to you on. Okay, I'm, I would be very interested in all of those things. Are most of these private loans, by the way, uh, are they loans with banks or some kind of self-lending where the college makes the loan and gets the interest? Um, it was actually a very complex uh, financial transaction that took place in these Genesis loans, and there's actually a couple different iterations. But broadly speaking, what happened was the loan was originated by 
a bank under the first iteration. The bank would immediately sell the loans back to Corinthian, and Corinthian would hold them on his books. They then interjected a third party in, a, in the second iteration where a loan would originate, and then a third party would hold them on their books unless and until they were, they were 90 days delinquent. Once they were 90 days delinquent, Corinthian would have the absolute obligation to repurchase those loans. So essentially, the third party bore none of the risk of default, um, but were paid a fee. You know, basically hold the loan on their books. Okay. I, I think really that the legislature needs to know as this proceeds what some of the options are in case we need to strengthen state law, quite honestly. Um, I know that bankruptcy law was changed in recent years to make it more difficult for individuals to uh, declare bankruptcy. What happens in a situation like this? Because it seems to me making the individuals who uh, were taken advantage of whole should be uh, a, a major interest of the state at this point. So I, you know, I, you can, it, it, I would like more information on that. Um, it certainly is, and I would say just briefly that I think a very, a very strong method of doing that, it, it would be incomplete, but it is precisely what we are doing. We are trying to establish, we're trying to prove our case and establish a factual basis for these students to go in and challenge their federal loans and assert the defense to repayment. I think they should not have to pay back their private loans. And if there are sweetheart deals between banks and these colleges, or self-dealing loans on the part of these colleges, those students should not be on the hook for that. So you need to tell us what would need to happen for that kind of an outcome. I will, we will do so. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Bates. Uh, very quickly, um, I think we all sit here stunned. Uh, if that's kind of an understatement to see uh, the demise of uh, this you know, uh, whole group of uh, private colleges. What troubles me in that is that they all have boards, and on the Corinthian College boards, there were some very prominent people. Did any of the agencies have been involved in the demise? And it seems to me there were places along the way that there could have been some interception if there was some discussion or contact with that board of directors. Was there any? Did you have any inter interaction with them? And in following up on Senator... Uh, <clears throat> uh, well, Senator Hancock, Senator Lonnie, uh, you know, do they have a responsibility in this? They're, they're a nonprofit corporate board. Uh, what were they doing when all this, when the demise started? I mean, I, I've sat on a number of boards, and when things start going a little sideways, uh, you are immediately involved in to what Senator Block was saying. There were laws that were supposed to be implemented. Do they have no responsibility in ensuring that happens? Maybe too many questions, but you just comment on it. I mean, well, I'm I, I think thinking, certainly, whoa, what went wrong here? I, I, certainly, they were, you know, not only was, so Corinthian itself, you know, I can say it was in, in the public filings. Corinthian was a public for profit company, had a board of directors. Um, certainly, the, you know, they bore respons responsibility uh, for what happened as well. Yield had a board of trustees. Um, is a, its own board of trustees that was required by its accreditor. Certainly they bore responsibility for what happened at Heald as well. Um, so that, that's certainly true. Uh, in terms of whether we've had contact with the board, um, certainly not as the board, but there, there have, I think, been communications with individual board members uh, from time to time, but not, um, I, I, think, I think that's where, that's where it's at. Well, I just suggest that there needs to be some relationship uh, with the state agencies and a board of directors uh, to ensure that there is compliance with the laws. I mean, they should know them, and if those are not being uh, attended to, uh, certainly they have a role to play in ensuring that that's happening uh, by their, the, the people they employ to implement uh, programs and you know, the uh, whole structure of, of the organization. So I just suggest going forward, we ought to think about something on that front. 
just to go back to um, Senator Hancock's request for a, a periodic update uh, from, I guess, all three of you, because you're all working together. Um, 30 days, 10 days, what do you suggest? What's convenient for you? We're tracking this information constantly, so whenever you want it, we're happy to provide it. Okay. Two weeks? Two weeks. <clears throat> Any more questions from members? Well, thank you very much. Been very productive. Oh, I'm sorry, Senator Galgiani. I did want, I did have one final question. I want to be sure that I absolutely understand this. Um, with regard to the STRIF fund, I know there's legislation to add to it, I believe, um, and there's 26 million in the STRIF fund there's presently right now. There's 28 million dollars. 28 million, and and I heard you say that if every single student applied, that. It would take that entire fund? Well, it would take $26 million if, if all students received the average STRIF claim, because there's no way to really know um, what that STRIF claim amount is going to be until we actually see what those claims are. Um, generally, we, we assist the students in getting their loans discharged first, and then we calculate the STRIF after their loans are discharged. Okay, but then there are students that have the private loans that won't be eligible for the STRIF? The private loans are eligible for STRIF. They're just not eligible for closed school discharge, generally. Okay. So okay. they are eligible for STRIF, and um, that's one of the things that we're, we clarify to students. Also, if they transfer, they may still be eligible for STRIF. Okay, so, so you presume that it, it could be that there is enough money in the fund, but there's no way to absolutely know until the request, until the reimbursement requests start coming in. Right. Okay. Okay, thank you. And the um, Hills College is not part of the strip? That's correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We will now move to... The fourth uh, panel, Educational Institution Efforts to Assist Corinthian Students. So please come forward. We have Paul Feast, Vice Chancellor for Communications, Community College Chancellor's Office. Michael Cunningham, PhD Chancellor, National University System President, National University. And Todd Erickson, Vice Provost, Enrollment and Strategic Initiatives for William Jessup University. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for your participation today. Thank you. Good morning. For several months now, we've been communicating with our colleges about the possibility of a failure of uh, Corinthian colleges. Uh, back in um, October, Chancellor Harris uh, wrote a letter to all the college presidents uh, uh, encouraging them to provide whatever assistance and support that they could um, provide to these students who um, may wish to continue their education at a community college. Uh, based on some information that we obtained from the Department of Education, we were also able to provide a profile of the Corinthian College in their, in their service area that discussed the, uh, the programs offered and also enrollment in those programs. Also leading up to the uh, closure of the colleges, we've been uh, working closely with the Attorney General's office. Um, we provided some content for the, um, the website uh, that was mentioned earlier, and I think that is probably one of the best web resources for Corinthian College students at this time. The week of the closure, um, we, like uh, many of the, set, the students uh, affected by this, didn't get a lot of notice. Um, but we were able to deploy our I Can Afford College uh, financial aid awareness campaign representatives to many of the, uh, the exit meetings the Corinthian administrators were holding with students uh, that week. Um, we provided information, general information about community college offerings, um, some of the initiatives that we have, like the associate degree for transfer, uh, the resources that we offer for student veterans, uh, and, and obviously information about financial aid. Uh, you know, that we are the most affordable system of public higher education in the country, uh, that there are financial aid, aid opportunities available, including the Board of Governors fee waiver. Uh, some of our colleges uh, also attended these exit meetings and were able to provide one-on-one -on -one, uh, 
contact with those students. Um, we, you heard about the, the webinar that was held. We participated in that. Uh, we continue to uh, provide support to uh, additional events and meetings. Uh, Senator Galgiani had uh, two events uh, in her district. We provided some resources for that. And we are um, hearing that colleges are starting to uh, hold some specific events for Corinthian students doing some outreach, and we're going to support those as well. We, uh, some of the questions that, that come up uh, with, uh, uh, from the students are uh, deal with the transferability of credits. And uh, the, what we're doing is the, the, some of these colleges already had existing articulation agreements with healed colleges. And so they, they know which credits will transfer and which won't. Um, and so in one case, I was at a college last week, and the admissions and records folks are sitting down with some of these students using their unofficial transcript and going through course by course to determine what, what courses can transfer. Unfortunately for the students at WyoTech and, and Everest, the, the process is much more difficult because it's not a they were not regionally accredited institutions. Um, so that concludes my remarks. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you.